Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Would you stand with me this morning? The promises of God are sure and amen. You can count on them 10 times out of 10 times, 100 times out of 100 times. And what God is looking for today is for us to truly believe. He just wants us to truly understand his word is true. His word is true. It's a simple, simple gospel that says Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's a simple gospel, but it is a powerful, powerful price, an expensive price that was paid. And he gives this to you and I as hope today, as an anchor for our problems, for our concerns, when we face things that this life absolutely says no way. God says, watch me, watch me. So you turn in the scripture today, I'm in part two of a series I started last week. Didn't know I was going to start a series, but you know, the more I read about God, the more I read about but God and how a but God situation can turn everything around in a minute, in a second. You can be going one way and absolutely the power of God, him speaking, him with the final word on your outcome means it'll all be changed and different. How many of you know that? Say amen. In honor of Thanksgiving, I've entitled this one, Not But God, Part 2, but I've called this one, Thank God. Look at somebody and say, Thank God. Genesis, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 50. I'm going to start with verse, verse 15, but I want to set it up for a little bit. You know the story of Joseph. Think about Joseph. Joseph is part of the, the, the heritage of the redemption plan. He is one of the forefathers of our faith, and we are so thankful for his sojourn because he absolutely set a beautiful example to us that we can look to today. We know without a shadow of a doubt God is in control even when the hardest of odds are stacked up against us. And Joseph sets that example for us. His brothers, as you know, were jealous of him. Especially, I mean, they had lived jealous of him because he was the favorite son of his father, Jacob. And boy, he was absolutely doted over and the father loved him. And the, the other guys, all 11 of them, were jealous as they could be. And when you really looked at the situation and knew it, man, they were absolutely eaten up with bitterness and jealousy over this young man. Well, it, it all ended one day when Joseph was telling them about a dream that he had. He had a dream that one day, he didn't know what it meant. He was just excited because God had given him a dream. This dream said, hey, one day all these corn stalks are going to bow to me. And they're all you guys. <laughs> and he's all excited and happy. And, and I know that's not exactly verbatim, but that's how it went. And every one of them just got so upset with him, they devised a plan against him. And as you know, they threw him in a pit, and then a couple guys felt sorry for him, and they went back and sold him into slavery to the Ishmaelites. So the favored son was now sold into bondage into, as a slave. Talk about a plan and a purpose or feeling like something had went desperately wrong. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but this guy felt that way. Then he's sold from slavery, bought by Potiphar in Egypt, and he takes him into his house. He finds favor. You know the story. His wife gets a little too weird, and the next thing you know, he's running for his life. Uh, story comes back. The wife lied because she was ticked off and mad, so then he ends up in prison. We know from there he's feeling left, dejected, absolutely abandoned all over again with this one little thing hidden down inside of his heart. God gave him a promise. God gave him a promise. And then we find that in the end of his life, things turned around and he, he found favor and ended up out of prison. And then he ended up as Pharaoh's prime minister over all of Egypt. And he run the show and he was favored and put way up high in, in political ways and in, over the government. And then we find at the end of his father's life that he's seeking the blessing for his sons. And Manasseh and Ephraim go to him and they literally, uh, they do a little switch there, but... but it ends up that the, the sons are blessed 
and Joseph is standing there, and he having looked back over his life, and in every instance, every scenario of his life, he would be quoted as saying, it was in, in Genesis 48, it was in Genesis chapter 39, to different places, he would say, but the Lord was with Joseph, or the Lord was with Joseph, the Lord was with me, over and over and over again. And we get to Genesis chapter 50, to the end of Jacob's life, when he... Um, was on his deathbed, and it says, When Joseph, verse 15's brothers, saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now, please, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, verse 19, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day. So important, that statement. In order to bring it about as it is this day. To save many people alive. Father, we ask your blessings over your word this morning. As we desire to please you and be challenged in our own heart to greater faith than ever before. May someone today receive you as Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank God for one promise of the Lord. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is with you and I. All throughout scripture, I love where uh, Joshua got the word, where God spoke to him and said, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. God is not any less powerful or any less involved right now than he's ever been. He wants to be a part of our lives, our present help, the Bible says, in the time of trouble. He is a God who is every bit right now. The world has caused much distraction, and there's a lot of stuff out there competing for God. But that doesn't make God any less powerful or mighty. He's the same God that performed the miracles in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And he is right here with us today. We've been worshiping. We've been feeling and sensing his presence. He's been touching in this altar this morning. This is what real faith is all about. It's about getting it out of the storybooks and the fable places of this world and making it a real life historical fact. He is with his people. God loves you and I, and he will not fail you and I. Every promise of God is sure, every one. And so it's right, when we look at the story of Joseph, we see that Joseph, man, he went through it. He went through the worst. He he couldn't have been any worse what he went through. I would think, and so many people would think, that he would get a little discouraged over some of the events that had happened in his life. And perhaps you have felt the same way at times. God had made a promise or God gave something to you that you knew was from him. Somebody prophesied over you when you were young or you had a dream or a word was given to you. You read in the word of God what it says for a child of God and you hung on to that and yet everything, everything has went totally opposite direction. Joseph was in that place He had been given a dream. He was excited about it. Next thing you know, he's looking up out of the hole in the ground. He could have sat down in the bottom of that pit and said, there is no way out. There is no answer. I must have been wrong. I must have ate spaghetti and meatballs that were not good. Something happened. That dream was not from God. He could have said that, but he never did. He always kept, kept the faith. He always stayed sure, no matter where he was at, whether it was in prison, whether he, he lifted up his eyes in prison, and there he never gave in. He felt forgotten. He felt forsaken. Nobody remembered him. He stayed there forever, and it just seemed like everybody else got favor, but he didn't. Have you ever seen that? The wicked get blessed. They get promoted. They get everything. They get the big house. They get the big job promotion. They get more money. They got better landscaping in their yard, and you sit back all watching as the world seems to be doing better than you are, and you're wondering. You look up, and you you say, God, what about me? 
Joseph could have done that, but he was so sure about who God is. And that's what's so amazing about this message. It seems to be simple. It seems that it's not, it's not some big theological dissertation that y'all write a book about. It simply says this, God is with his people. God does not fail his people. He won't fail his people. We've got to just get to the place where we will truly believe that. Wasn't it true when the disciples were on the, on the water and the, ra- the waves were torrent and they were crazy and they were splashing against the boat and the wind was crazy and everything was falling apart? They were throwing everything off the ship and they wake Jesus up and they're like, do you not care that we perish? And Jesus got up, went upstairs, said, be still, went back, stairs, went back downstairs and went to bed. Somebody says, I didn't read that in the Word. Well, I, I you know. It didn't say what he did after that, so that's mine. (laughs) He wouldn't care, would he? He looked up, he calmed the storm, but he looked at them and said something so powerful that we've got to hang on to today. We've got to hang on to, well, where is God? Where is he in the Republicans? Where is he in the Democrats? Where is he in the White House? Where is he in the world market? Where is he on my job? Where is he at the hospital? Where is he? I'm telling you, we've got to have faith. Jesus looked at them and said, why is it that you don't have faith? Why don't you have faith? You know, I found it true in my own life that that where I stand even today has been because of impossibilities. It's never been because I deserved it, I worked hard for it, I had the right connections. It wasn't any of that. I don't stand up here. I am the poster child for, sorry, Dad. I was the poster child for not having a rich daddy and for not having big connections and not having a lot of tithe in the church. I didn't have a connection. There wasn't no bishop in the church of God that knew me. I had no opportunities in the world to get here, right here. But I'm telling you, God had a plan and a purpose, and he knows where to find his people. And he don't go looking for the most acceptable. He don't go looking for the most powerful or the richest or the smartest, even the best looking. You're stuck with the redheaded guy because God has a plan for those that have no dependence on themselves. Joseph had lost all dependence on his own power. He absolutely knew there was no way for him to get an answer. He saw no sense, no pattern. He couldn't pinpoint and see, oh, look what God is doing. He wasn't sitting in the prison walking around going, well, I know where I'm at, but oh, I can trace God. I can see what God, no. He's he's in there, you know, saying I'm holding on. But other people were scratching their head going, Joseph, everything's going backwards for you. This is a hopeless situation. There's no way for this to change. There ain't, you ain't going up and out of here. The best thing you'll want is to just get a little extra food rationing because you're stuck in this prison. And the devil tells you over and over again, there's no hope. There's no, going to be no change. There's not going to be any deliverance. There's not going to be any miracle. It ain't going to happen. Let me tell you, it, it, you got to get to the place where it's hopeless and it's impossible in order for God to do his best work. God when it's nothing. I was talking with MIP and CAM students yesterday and I was sharing with them about the way God builds a church. I said God usually lets you hit one brick wall after another. You just keep hitting them and you have to get the place where you have extravagant faith and believe God for big things. I'll never forget when God spoke to my heart. A little lady from our church walked down to the altar one Sunday and she said Pastor, here's $500. I want you to put this in the new roof account. And I said in the new roof account at that time, the, the roof was doing pretty well. and probably wasn't going to need one for 10 more years. And I said, well, thank you very much. And, and you might be here today. And thank you because you were used in a miracle. But she gave me that. But my first thought was, well, that'll be sitting in the account for a long time. I took it into Judy. And I said, Judy, here's $500. Put this in the official new roof account. She said, we don't have that account. I said, yeah, we do now. Put that in there, and several months later, I'm, uh, the Lord had spoke to me that day, and he said, you, you put that in that account, and you, you, know, you take care of it, and it'll just be there. And so several months later, uh, I'm hearing about 
the, the Jackson Church of God over on the east side of the state and the young man there and his wife pastoring and they didn't have hardly anything. They only got two rooms in this church and it's a very small church and, and, and they had had the roof cave in over where they have service and they couldn't have service there. They were meeting in somebody's living room in their house and I, I, and I heard about it and I had the Lord speak to me and he said, give them that $500 as a tithe. And I said, well, absolutely, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I walked into my staff meeting. I said, look, you know, the, the Jackson church has suffered. There, a lady had gotten hurt even by a tile that fell in. And I said, well, I'm going to send this $500. It's not much, but it's what we have, and I'm going to send it uh, to them. The Lord actually told me to give this as a tithe to them. And, well, the youth department said, um, well, we want to give 500 And the children's department said, well, we want to give 500 So we ended up sending $1,500. And I was proud of that. And I thought, well, that's wonderful. We'll just send this. It'll help them. And I get a phone call back. The young man's crying on the phone. He says, our bill was around 1400 You paid for the whole thing. Thank you so much for what you did. And it was so exciting. And God did that. But here's, as awesome as that was, God knew what he was doing, right? He turned around and knowing now our roof account was empty. And, and I didn't think anything about it. I thought, well, you know, one day we'll, we'll have that roof money. And I told Judy, we've got to put that $500 back in there because that was designated funds. So we were going to take care of that. But I knew that the Lord had told me to give that. And it was about a year later that we are, um, remember when that hurricane come up through Louisiana and hit this church and all the tiles went crazy and we had all kinds of damage happen to the church? Well, we called the insurance and they said, mm -mm, no, no. Now, that roof was old anyway. Anyhow, there ain't no way. And we were like, oh, come on, you know, look at it again. No, 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 word, final word, no, no, you got to pay for it yourself. And by this time, the roof was definitely damaged. There was leaks all over the building. And I told uh, council, we talked about it, and said, we're just going to have to, we're going to have to chill out on the building program. We're going to have to stop dead in our tracks, or we're going to have to start a fundraiser because it's going to cost $103,000 to put a new roof on this church. And, um, Somebody made a joke and said, well, I wish we had that $500 now. I said, yeah, that would help get us started. But we've got to, we'd have a long way to go. So I was a little discouraged. I thought, what are we going to do? We're going to have to do some bake. How many bake sales will that be? Oh, no. <laughs> Trying to get this done. And, and I get, it's a general assembly time, so I get on the plane. Judy says, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know, Judy. We're just going to pray. I get on the plane. I'm just upset. I'm worried about it. And I get down there, I'm praying about it, and in the morning, down there at General Assembly, I was praying, and the Lord spoke to me and said, Do, don't you remember what I said to you? I said, I remember about that roof account. He said, I told you to give that $500, and when you did, it'd be a tithe. And he said, and when you need it, I'll take care of you. And I said, yes, you did, you said that. He said, do you believe me? I said, I believe you. I called Judy on the phone. I said, Judy, don't worry about it. I said, I was praying this morning, and the Lord reminded me of that $500 tithe that we sent to that other church. And I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know what's going to happen, but absolutely, it's going to be taken care of. And she said, all right, I'll believe with you. She says, I'm going to stick on your side. And she started praying with me. I said, do you agree with me every day? We're going, we're going, this is going to get worked out. I want you to know... I went through that whole week, went to assembly, went to the services. We had a great time. The Lord moved. I got to the airport. I was getting ready to fly home after all the business meetings and all the services. And Judy called me on the phone at the airport, sitting at the airport, ready to get on the airplane. And she said, are you sitting down? I said, no. She said, sit down. I said, what? She said, another adjuster came by, looked at the thing, went back. They've wrestled and fought over it. He took pictures. He went back and declared that absolutely was a hurricane mess. They're sending us a check for $103,000. that will be here by the time you get home. Do you see that you can hold on to the promises of God? He can say it in a prayer. He can just give it to you in a moment. And he will absolutely follow through on his word. God will be God in every circumstance, no matter how impossible it looks. The world said no. The insurance adjuster said no. But God changed the heart of Pharaoh, changed the heart of the insurance adjuster, and turned this thing around. That's the testimony. It's not so much that we got the roof. Although, I will challenge you, as you leave today, please gander up at the top and look at that pretty roof. Because that was a gift from God to this church. A gift from the Lord. But the greater testimony is this. 
He absolutely is a God who will intervene in the small and the big, in the impossible and the absolutely ridiculous. He will always show up. God is going to be God. And when it's all said and done, the ones who are hanging on, the ones that endure to the end, the Bible says the same, shall be saved. God is the one that comes through, and you can hold on to that. The world is competing for that. They want you to trust in them. They want you to trust in their philosophies and their ideas. And, and, and the world wants to wear you down and wear your faith down. I, in the place of God, he said, but as for you, okay, let, let's be honest, guys. You meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good. He took your evil desire. He took that evil scheme and device that's against you or against your family. He took, God took that device that was used against you. And God, it says, but God meant it for good in order to bring it. Bed and her little body was beaten up and eaten up with cancer. And she was just a little thing, a little breath laying on that bed. And she looked up at us with her, her hair just perfect. And she, she raised up off that bed and she started praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. And she looked at us and prophesied over Pastor and then prophesied over me. And she looked back in the bed and looked up in the corner of the room and she said, I'm ready to go. She laid back down speaking in tongues on her pillow. And the next morning she was dancing the streets of glory. But what I loved about that was her little body was nothing. There was nothing left. She didn't have enough strength to walk across the room. Her outward man was perishing. But oh, I saw a giant on the inside of her. I saw power in her. She prophesied and she said things. She spoke life over me. She spoke life over Pastor Watkins. She, she told him, she said, you will see the salvation of every one of your children. And I want you to know all six of his other siblings, none of them were serving God at all at that time. And he said, I'll take that as a word from the Lord. And when he left here as pastor of our church seven years ago, every single one of his brothers and sisters had come to Jesus and had gotten saved. Her word came true. She also said something else. She said something about my family that came absolutely true. And it was amazing, the power of God that was in that little woman. But what this showed me was this. She didn't look at cancer as an enemy that defeated her. She looked at that as something God was using to get her home. She was looking at these things and the, the things of this life, the afflictions and persecutions of, of her time. She was looking at that as just a, end, a, a means to an end. She just was trying to get somewhere, and she got there. And I want to tell you, when she left this world, you wouldn't have thought much of her physical appearance. But I guarantee you this, heaven opened up its gates wide with angels and all kinds of bands. I believe that woman was received as a celebrity and a VIP in heaven. She was strong on the inside. And that's what you and I have got to be. We've got to say, though the wind blows, though the torrents are against us, though the traps of the enemy are there, though that he tries his best to kidnap our children and our families, though he comes against us in every way, we will stand the course and the test of time. And we will not be defeated. As a matter of fact, we will let these trials, these troubles be used in our life to make us strong, make us gallant. He may knock us down, but every time he does we're stronger in our muscle and we'll stand up and fight harder than we ever have before this is the determination that'll cause us to cross the finish line paul went on to say in verse 17 for our light affliction now you do remember paul don't you shipwrecked paul prison paul beaten up paul for our light affliction which is but for a moment for a moment, it's working for us far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, Paul is saying something I'm trying to get across to us this morning. It doesn't matter, Sister Wood, what attacks us. It doesn't matter if it's physical. It doesn't matter if he wants to try a disease. It doesn't matter if he wants to try and get us weak and knock us down. His plan will only be used by God while we do not look at the things which are seen. But we look at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, they are temporary. Every affliction, every problem, every trial, no matter what it is, you can say along with the rest of the world, this too will pass. Because it does not matter in light of the power of Almighty God in our lives. But we don't look at those things which are seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. And he says this, but the things which are not seen, 
they are eternal. How many of you are looking for an eternal weight of glory over your life? We're not interested in making ourselves a success in this world. The greatest heritage I can leave you young people is simply this. It won't be the building that we've built for you. It won't be all the programs we've got and all this ministry. What will absolutely take you all the way through your life to victory is that we'll leave an old-time heritage of faith in God, standing on the promises of God and being determined that the Word of God is our true foundation. That is what the heritage we want to leave for you as a church. And with that truth, you'll build a life that'll be successful and you'll get all the way to glory. What was those things? Paul said, here's his list of light afflictions, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. At night and a day I spent in the deep waters of the ocean. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, from robbers, from countrymen, from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. He said, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but trust in God. He said, who does he trust? Who is his faith in? Who is his confidence in? He goes on and writes this. My trust is in he who raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. He will raise us up also with Jesus. This is the confidence that we have. This is the truth that will build your family, build our church. This is where we are today. Trust in the one who raised up Jesus. I want to sing that song. I already sang for you once. I won't sing again. But I, through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon his word. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. He said, I thank God for the mountains. I thank him for the valleys. I thank him for the storms he's brought me through. For if I'd never had a problem, I wouldn't know God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God can do. I'm telling you, if you'll look for it, there is a silver lining over your despair. There is absolutely a victory at the top of the storm clouds. I love the fact that when I travel, if I get into a good storm, if you'll just wait just long enough, just, just give it a few minutes. It may be a little rough as you're going through the thunder, the lightning and the rain. But there's a moment in time, I love it, when that plane just bam hits through the last cloud and you're up above it all and you look down and the darkness is below you but all in front of you is clear blue skies and a sun shining bright let me tell you it doesn't matter what it looks like to you in the in this temporary time it doesn't matter what you're looking at i feel this all the way to my feet for somebody this morning it does not matter what the circumstance looks like for you right now what you need to do is look beyond it to the god who absolutely has got your victory in his hand. I will look under the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. Stand with me this morning. All throughout Jacob's life, he trusted. Abraham trusted. Moses trusted. Joshua trusted. Joseph trusted. And Joseph wept when his brothers were a nervous wreck. Brothers didn't know if he'd kill him or not. They knew what they'd done. They sent word. They made up some story about, your dad says before he died, he left a decree. Begging you, please don't kill your brothers. Forgive them. When Joseph got it, he's sitting in Pharaoh's palace he wept and he cried he wept he looked for the opportunity to forgive them he looked for the opportunity because you see God had done such a work through his trials that it made him 
a man of God, a man after God. And in that process, there wasn't anything in him that didn't want to trust God. And so what God had done in bringing him out, he was willing to share with someone else. He wanted his brothers to know that same redemption, that same presence and power. I want us this morning to be challenged. Jesus looks at us in the midst of our storm, in the midst of the wind blowing in your life, the trial that's in your life, the sorrow that's in your life. And he says, will you have faith? Will you believe? I'll never forget, and I think I shared this with you last week, but somebody needs to hear it this morning. I stood right here at the 830 service. Three discs in my back were completely destroyed. I'd fallen out of an attic onto a concrete floor, and they told me I was going to end up having to have surgery. I stood over there, and I had a walking cane. Bob, you know all too well. And I walked up on stage. It was all I could do to get one step at a time. And I stood right here, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said this. He said, I'm holding you, Pastor. I'm holding you to my word. I saw a preacher one time on television. He was, you know, and you got to be so careful what you watch these days. He's got his fist up. He said, God, I'm holding you to your word. And he was just, you know, and I was like <laughs> stepping back from the TV thinking lightning was going to strike. How many of you know this this morning? God don't need us to hold him to his word. I will remember my covenant forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Your mama will fail you. Your daddy will fail you. This preacher will fail you. The church of God will fail you. Men will fail you. The government will fail you. Failure will come at every hand all over this world. But there is one you can count on. The one who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. A God of covenant. A God of promise. A God that will not fail you. This promise will come. You may be in the pit right now. You may be in the, in the prison right now. You may feel like there's no answer for you right now. But understand, the promise of God is on the way. It's coming. As surely as Bethlehem saw a star, you and I are going to see the victory of God over your life, my life. We're going to see the promise of God fulfilled. I don't have to say that with a little conscious worry. I don't have to say that with any caution. I'm telling you it bold. I'm telling it to you like a lion this morning. You can trust God. You can trust Him every day, every minute, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're looking at. You can trust God. If somebody ought to say amen before I just run. You can trust the Lord. You can trust Him this morning. You need financial miracle. You look to the author and the finisher of your faith. You look to the one who is the provider. For my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. You need that this morning. You come to God. You trust God. You need healing this morning. He is the one who brought healing atonement through his blood sacrifice. You need your sins forgiven. You don't have to worry. You haven't gone too far. If you've got that in your heart this morning and you need salvation, he was absolutely wounded for your transgressions. He was chastised for your peace. He literally has got you in the palm of his hand. He's ready to meet the need in your life. Do you believe that this morning? Somebody agree with me and shout and give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We honor you, God. It doesn't matter what the world says. You've got an answer in God. Absolutely. Psalm 48. Listen, this is for our children as well. Psalm 48, walk about Zion and go all around her. In other words, look at what God has done. 
Look back in the word what God has done. Look what he's done in your family. Look what he's done for you on the job. Look what he's done in the past. If he's ever done anything right, if he's ever done anything good you could count on. Brother Cleveland, you're a pastor. You're a man of God. You're somebody who's trusted in the Lord and leaned on him year after year, generation after generation. He hasn't left you today. He's as strong in your life as he ever was right now in this very moment. He is a God you can count on. Look around Zion. Walk all around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that you may tell it to the generation following. For this is our God. Our God forever and ever. And he will be our guide even into death. He is all the way. He's all in. God is all in. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. I'd be amiss this morning if I didn't give you the opportunity to accept Christ into your life. You need Jesus. You need him. It's not about a preacher begging you to come forward. It's about you needing to respond to God's work in your heart. No man gets saved unless the Holy Spirit is drawing him. If you aren't being drawn right now, this is a waste of my time. But if you are right here right now in need, and you're somebody who Jesus wants to save, he wants you to get right, he wants life to turn around for you, he wants to give you eternal life, if that is you, and the Holy Spirit is working in your heart right now, I want you to slip your hand up right where you are and right back down. We're going to pray a prayer in just a moment. God bless you, ma'am. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? God bless you. I need Jesus, Pastor, and I want to pray a prayer with you to receive him into my life. God bless you, sister. Come on forward. You, some of you ladies will go be with this lady. Anyone else? I want Jesus. I like it when they'll just get out and walk down the front. That's all right. They want Jesus in their life. You want Jesus in yours? You need him in your heart? You need him in your life? I'm waiting just a few more seconds. We want to pray. I need Jesus, Pastor. I want to pray the prayer. God bless you, sister. Anyone else? I need Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for these that have lifted their hands. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? God bless you. Anyone else? Holy Spirit's working in hearts. Thank you, Lord, for these. Would you write where you are all over this congregation this morning? Would you take just a few moments and step out and meet me in the altar? We want to come together to help it e- make it be easier for these folks. Would you come forward? These are, there's some folks that are standing here in the altar that have yellow lanyards on. They want to minister to you in particular. They want to give you a Bible and they want to help you today in your new walk with Jesus. But all over the congregation, if you come forward, we're going to pray a prayer with these folks. It's our way of helping usher them in to the throne room of grace. Would you come? Thank you for these that are coming. If you lifted your hand, please come. All right, all over the congregation, would you help me now? We're going to pray a prayer. I've said this many times. I feel it's important to say we're going to pray a prayer. The prayer in and of itself cannot save you. But if the Lord is doing a work in your heart right now, it'll be the most important prayer you've ever prayed. This prayer will save your soul. So if you mean it from your heart, you speak it with your mouth, I'm telling you, God is going to change your lives. Let's all, can we do that? Let's all pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you're the son of God. You died on the cross for me. And you rose from the dead. You purchased my salvation. I declare that you're my savior. And I make you my Lord. According to your word, I believe this in my heart. I confess it with my mouth. According to your word, I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Would you write where you are? Just help me. Would you lift up your hands and honor the presence of the Lord? The Bible says lift up holy hands unto God. If you're comfortable with that, Lord, we come to you today. 
we give ourselves completely to you. We trust you. We lean hard upon you, Lord. We understand and know we have so much to be thankful for in our lives. God, we're thankful that you are a God who loves us, that you're a God in touch with your people, that, Lord, we can lean hard upon you. I thank you for those that are trusting you today. I thank you for your church, Lord, that loves you. I pray that you will minister grace and strength to them and let the work of God be accomplished. Lord, we're thankful this week. We thank you for Thanksgiving, that we have a moment in time in our lives throughout a year where we can be thankful for our families, thankful for your love and mercy, thankful for your blessings in our lives. Be with your church. Touch us as we go from this place now in the power of your might, living and breathing out the salvation experience that you've given to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone together said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Don't forget tonight at 6 p.m. and then Tuesday. Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, we will be having our special Thanksgiving gathering. I'll be speaking, and we'll have special music. God bless you.